Deward was an interesting man. He was old school. He was rigid and right. And he didn't mind letting you know where you stood with him. It was a hot summer Wednesday evening and I was leading out in prayer meeting and the air conditioning wasn't working in the church. I had dressed conservatively, I thought, a long maxi dress. It was sleeveless, but I had a jacket on. But the temperature in the chapel was too warm, and so I took off my jacket and presented the evening's topic. After prayer meeting, Deward set me straight. Two things were inexcusable, my sleeveless dress and the fact that I wore sandals. Oh, no, no, sandals showed toes, and toes were unacceptable for nice Christian women. The next Sabbath, he showed up at church with a 50-page paper on the appropriate attire for women to wear in church or anywhere. I still have it somewhere in one of my boxes. He, in it, he quoted from Vogue magazine somewhere in the early 1900s or late 1890s. Now, I admit that it didn't set well with me. I wanted to be rebellious and do exactly what would irritate him. But today's message on Christians dress for success is not found in Deward's 50-page epistle to Pastor Jan. No, the Christian's dress for success has to do with wearing Christ's robe of righteousness. So let's take a look at what Paul has to say in Colossians 3. Paul begins this portion of his teaching with the contrast of two perspectives. We have a heavenly perspective for those who desire to follow Jesus and be baptized. And and they've chosen to be buried with Jesus in a watery grave, symbolizing death to the old way of life and having been resurrected to a new life of following Jesus. So verse 1 begins, If then you were raised with Christ... Seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Paul admonishes believers to keep the heavenly perspective. A continual perspective of Jesus. I like what Hebrews 12, 2 says. Looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith. The imperative seek means to search out and to pursue this spiritual path. Verse 2 continues. Set your mind. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. It's not just our feelings, but it's this mental decision to be grounded, not in the earthly pursuits, but to have a mindset that focuses on Christ. And verse 3 continues, For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. This again is talking about the experience of baptism. You were buried in the waters of baptism, a symbol of death. And when you died, you came up, not as an old you, but as Christ living in you. His character, his thoughts, his actions are now seen through you. And when Christ, who is of our life, appears, verse 4, then you will also appear with him in glory. Paul is assuring us that as we take this journey with Jesus, we can have confidence 
when Jesus comes again. And we will be with him in glory and we will share of his glory. Verse 5 continues, Therefore, put to death your members which are on earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desires, covetousness, which is idolatry. We talked about that in Sabbath school today. Covetousness, which is idolatry. Therefore, because your life is hidden with God, everything that is foreign to God's kingdom needs to be eradicated in our life. The physical acts of illicit relationships, the impure desires of our mind, even covetousness, which is self-worship, self-desire. And, you know, as, as we are, are raised to this new life in Christ, God begins to change our desires. He begins to change the things inside of us. I, I would often tell one of my Bible study interests that, you know, I kill as much as I want. I steal as much as I want. You know, the thing is, with Christ living in me, I want, don't want to do those things. God changes the things in our life. And verse 6 says, Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. There's hope for the, the person who is at the lowest end. There's hope for, for anyone because you can have walked that path, but you can be forgiven, you can be clean, you can be restored. We listen to the news of the violence, the greed, the crimes, the selfishness. We know that God's wrath is aroused as he sees the injustice, the hate of humans. But there's hope for these sinners, just as there's hope for us. I like what Paul says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. The good news is really good news. Jesus can take the vilest sinner and can transform his or her life. And, and, and when they come to the bottom and, and they look up at Jesus, he's there. When we come to him in repentance, he's faithful and merciful. He forgives and we are totally restored. I, that's so awesome to me. He doesn't hold our past up before us to taunt us. It's Satan who's the accuser of the brethren. What was once our natural inclination, God wants us to visualize the removal of those characteristics that distract from his beautiful character. Pastor Victoria is going to be our sermon prop and model for what God desires us to do. So I've got to give her just a minute more. I think she's almost ready. And now Paul goes through some imperatives. He says, but now you yourselves are to put off anger. Anger is one letter away from danger. It's a mental flare that often comes on rapidly when we feel some type of injustice. Maybe our ego is b big and somehow we are offended. Anger should inform us to be thoughtful. What caused me to go from zero to 100 emotionally in a nanosecond? It does not reflect the patience and kindness of God. And God says, we need to take off anger. Then he says, we need to take off wrath. Now, wrath is rage, it's fury, it's ire, it's madness, it's acting out of anger. We all know what road rage is, right? 
Very seldom do people intentionally irritate another person on the road, and yet people often take it personally. I know I've been a victim of road rage. When I was unsure of where to turn in, I turned at the last second. This man chased me in his pickup, and he stopped his, he went around me, and he stopped his pickup in the middle of the road right in front of me. Wrath needs to be discarded by the disciple of God. It's not attractive, and it's not compelling. Malice. Malice, too, needs to be cast aside. Malice is spite and meanness, nastiness and cruelty, wickedness, mischievousness, evil. God's desire for us is to be totally transformed, not to cling to any characteristic that is out of harmony with his character. And then he says, we're to take off blasphemy. Now, blasphemy is sacrilege. It's speaking evil or profane against God or sacred things. And then he says, filthy language. Get filthy language out of your mouth. God desires our speech to be pure. Out of the abundance of the, of the thoughts the mouth speaks, we're not to swear We're not to be suggestive or to talk rudely or crudely about others. Do not lie to one another since you've put off the old man with his deeds. Indeed, we're to be truthful in all our speaking. Satan is the father of lies. And when we speak untruths or partial truths, we are his sons and daughters. We're not God's. Paul is saying that these things don't look attractive on Christians. They need to be removed to be cast off. And verse 10 goes on to say, and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. And who's that? It's Christ, yes, who created us in his own image Yes, so when we come up from the watery waters of baptism, we come hidden in Christ. We are renewed in the mind of Christ. We become a new creature, and that is available to everyone and anyone. Verse 11, I love this. Whether there's either Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, nor free, but Christ is all in all. The barbarian was someone who did not speak Greek. And people thought, if you don't speak Greek, you're uncivilized. The Scythian was someone who was savage or uncouth. But we are reminded that labeling is not becoming in the life of a Christian We are all children of God. And in God's kingdom, there are no stepchildren. And so he says, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved. Now, before I get to the rest of these words, I want you to note those three words that God used to describe us. The elect of God. Holy, beloved. God has elected everyone to be saved. He desires to have a relationship with each person individually. And it's up up to us to accept him. He sees us as holy when our life is hidden in Christ. Isn't that great news? He calls us beloved. I think of of God's words to Jesus when he was baptized. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And Christ calls us beloved. 
We are cherished. We're valued. Isn't that beautiful? And because of that, we are to put on these, correct, these characteristics. We're to put on tender mercies. Tender mercies. Compassionate, undeserved favor. It's the gentlest of gentle touch. It's being super sensitive to feelings. And then he says we're to put on kindness. Thoughtfulness, helpfulness. It's making the other feel, feel valued. It's that soft, warm, fuzzy attention to others. Christ was kind to the hurting, the broken, the bruised. Kindness feels good. And then he says, we're to put on humility. Now, humility is unpretentiousness. It's being modest. It's not attention-seeking. It's having this humble spirit of, of feeling not better than someone, but, but just being considerate. And then we are to put on meekness. Now, meekness is being teachable and submissive. So we're to become meek, teaching, teachable, and submissive. We're to be long-suffering. We're to show extended patience with others. We're to bear with one another and forgive one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. I tell you what, forgiveness is such a huge thing. Patience and forgiveness are two qualities that we need more. Since I need grace so desperately in my own life, how can I withhold grace from you? My debt to God is much greater than your debt to me. And I believe God wants me to watch my tongue more than I do. I need to build others up, not tear others down. And this is the area in my life where God is convicting me that instead of recognizing the faults of others, I need to imagine what it's like to be in their shoes with their feelings, with their challenges. And our final accessory of the Christian life is listed here in verse 14. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Now I want you to notice Pastor Victoria's robe of love. It includes people of every color and walk of life. Love embraces all. God said we would be known by our unity and by our love. Now, I used to quote this verse, but above all these things put on love, which is a bond of perfection. I used to quote this verse to a German shepherd dog that would walk with me. He would, she was not my dog, um, but she would walk with me every day when I do my four-mile walk. And I'd, I would quote that especially when she came to other dogs that she felt like she needed to chase off because she was being protective of me. I would say, put on love. Sometimes, maybe a lot of times, we need to pray a quick prayer for God's help in putting on love. God wants it to become part of our wardrobe. And then in verse 15, he says, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which also you were called in one body and be thankful. I think of the verse, great peace have those who love thy law and nothing shall offend them. God wants peace to rule in our hearts. He wants us to trust him. He wants us to be unified 
He wants us to be thankful. Wow, what a challenge for all of us warriors and doubters, or those of us uncomfortable with what life hands us. And the next verse tells us how to do it. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. You know, I like that verb, dwell. It's the same word used in the Old Testament for tabernacled. We can't let the word of God dwell in us if we aren't reading it, if we're not listening to it, or making it part of our lives. I also like the idea of songs and singing. Music lifts one's spirit higher. It's immersing ourselves in the heavenly realm in praise. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Giving thanks to God the Father through him. So no matter what we're speaking or what action we're taking, we are to do it in God's name and for his glory. But you see, this is not about what we do. It's about being raised in Christ. It's having our life hidden in him. So how does it happen? It's a daily experience. We die daily. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Therefore, I no longer live. Jesus Christ now lives in me. No matter where we are, whether we're seekers, whether we're living in the world currently, whether we are Pharisees, or whether we are growing, this experience is available to all. Debbie and Connie join me up here. They're going to help by singing this song, I Am Crucified with Christ. And they're going to sing it through twice, and we're going to join them. And it's my dream that we seek the heavenly. We seek those things that are above. We allow Jesus to clothe us with his righteousness. Because that's the Christian's true dress to success. I am crucified with Christ. crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live. Jesus Christ now lives in me. I am crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live. Jesus Christ now lives in me. I am crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live. Jesus Christ now lives in me. I am crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live. Jesus Christ now lives in me. Crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live. Jesus Christ now lives in me. I am crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live. Jesus Christ now lives in me. Father in heaven, 
we are reminded today that you want something more for us, that you want your character to be reflected in our lives. And Father, help us to die daily and to let you shine through, let our life be hidden in you, that we may be a witness for your incredible grace and love. Bless us now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.